Welcome to the Jeff Larson Show on Innovation and Leadership. I'm really excited on this episode to be joined again with my friend and, and co-host for today, Laura Walker-Lee. She's uh, founder of Madre Ventures and also CEO of AG Capital. Uh, Laura, today's guest is pretty great, uh, but I'm going to let you do the honor here. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, I'm so excited about this conversation. Um, I think that you, Jess, and you, Roxana, are two of the, some of the most dynamic people that I know. Um, and you really master the directions that you go in. And I, I had a challenge looking at um, Roxana's uh, bios online and in my research. It's really hard to redact anything from what she's done because it's so impressive. And I would just like to read through um, some things that I found. So um, Roxana, you're, you're, an, you're an investor, artist, film producer with a deep passion for impact investing, the environment and future led innovation which sounds very broad, but the truth is, is that you get into such specifics at such a high level of, in terms of execution. I just have to read some of these things. So straddling the realms of finance and art, uh, Roxana is chairwoman of the Impact Advisory Board of White Oak Global Advisors, chairwoman of Impact One, founder of Possible X, and advisor to Fortune 500 C-class executives. Roxana's had two decades of um, executive leadership experience in banking with senior positions held at Credit Suisse, Edmund de Rothschild, Merrill Lynch, J.P. Morgan, and the EBRD. Uh, She also serves as deputy CEO of Poland's largest bank, Bank um, Pekao. Is that how you say it? Pekao? That's it. Perfect. Oh, wow. Nailed it. Well done. Uh, Between (laughs) 2018 and 2020. Um, As a World Economic um, Forum young global leader, Roxana leverages her business and finance acumen to champion social impact uh, mentor investors and inspire entrepreneurship globally. Uh, Roxana is also a highly regarded artist in residence for Fabergé, exploring the complex relationship between contemporary art and human sustainability built around the Japanese concept of um, kintsugi, which I, I think is a beautiful practice, um, with installations built on the foundations of optimism, courage, and hope for the future. Roxana founded the Impact Art Movement, um, supported by Singularity University, and exhibits her climate action um, art globally through a series of sculptures uh, linked to climate action and the United Nations climate change um, uh, conferences. Um, You're also a producer of films, an investor in films. You also just recently um, uh, executive produced um, a documentary with Oliver Stone um, called Nuclear Now, which I definitely want you to talk about. So... So there you have it. There is Roxana. I mean, Roxana, I am just like completely floored by it doesn't even seem like a pivot. Like you were so successful in banking and you at some point made a life switch um, into blending that whole resume and acumen into art. And I would I would love for you to talk about that. Well, thank you so much and such a pleasure to be here, Jess and Laura. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you know, I heard somewhere that if your CV is like very long, that means that uh, you really have an issue. And if you can define your CV in a very short space, uh, look, the bottom line is, I guess I also um, kind of lived enough years as well. So I had the opportunity to, to try different things. Uh, But the reality is that um, when I was younger, my parents had very high expectations of me to become either a doctor or a lawyer. And I decided last minute to go against it because I really had no idea what I wanted to do. So I decided to study business and engineering uh, because I believed it will give me a very broad range of uh, possibilities. And in fact, uh, the company that is right now... uh, kind of an umbrella for all my various activities is called Possible X. So endless possibilities. Um, and I guess, again, when I was younger, it wasn't a very popular choice to be someone who is interested in art, in engineering, finance. Um, and despite all the good advice from my family, I decided truly, for whatever reason, to listen to my gut and, and explore this world of possibilities. Um, so it's not for everyone. Uh, I actually, I uh, used to think and admire if someone has a very clear vision and a path. And for example, they know that they want to be a doctor and they pursue it. Uh, there is definitely take certain personality. 
But I also knew it's not me. Uh, hence, I pursued so many different uh, paths. And I do feel that the beauty of getting older and more experienced is that uh, you can become uh, much more true to yourself. And I guess um, I actually professionally, indeed, I've spent uh, two decades, which sound, makes me sound very old, but many years in finance. Uh, but I feel that that allowed me to pursue my other passions. Uh, and in fact, art indeed is one of the strong passions. Uh, but I do, I used to always say that I never wanted my art to become my job, uh, because I believe it will lose its shine. So, so in fact, I've been a financier, so I can finance a few of my passions. Um, so, so I believe now I lead a portfolio of life, as I call it. So, portfolio of projects I care about uh, that involves also people that I enjoy spending time with and that's hopefully also contributing positively uh, to the world somehow. Oh, that's so beautiful. You know, for for Jess's listeners who um, are just very high achieving people, maybe type A personalities, um, I would love for you to talk about accessing creativity. I know that you're guest lecturing at Stanford soon um, to teach people about accessing their own creativity. And could, could you tease any of those concepts here and, and talk about what, what you plan to teach? Sure. So actually, indeed, from next week, so I'm flying to California on Saturday and uh, we'll be um, guest lecturing uh, a course, which is on redefining uh, creativity. Um, so again, as I've already mentioned to you, creativity has been really an integral part of my life. I used to paint and draw. I moved into photography. Then I started experimenting actually in Vancouver. So we spoke with Jess before. I've got a little bit of a Canadian link as well. So uh, that's actually where I took a bit of a break from my financial career and I studied uh, photography and had my first exhibition it was 20 years ago in Vancouver um, and then started experimenting with different media uh, photography on brush aluminum became my signature style large scale I started adding uh, diamonds and technology as well so I feel that in my life in my pur pursuing of uh, my creativity I kept adding complexity to it but what happened recently, actually, and I almost feel like this is this whole life journey, I have actually culminated in a way my latest work in the form of a 3D sculpture. And it's a very simple, it's a, it's a re uh, recycled stainless steel sphere that represents the world without borders. And as Laura mentioned, uh, I've been fascinated by the Japanese concept of kintsugi, golden repair. So when you break an object, let's say a plate, you can either discard it and it loses its value, or you can actually piece it together with gold and the object becomes more beautiful for, for having been broken. The object becomes actually stronger. So it's such a beautiful metaphor for life, for us human beings as well, going through experiences in life and being broken. Uh, but actually these are our gold, golden stars we should embrace rather than hide them. So when I learned this concept, I truly had this aha moment. You know, like in life, we sometimes go through these aha moments. And that was definitely one of these. Um, I discovered this philosophy actually when in uh, Japan. Uh, so looking back now, uh, I've been um, teaching or I've been uh, doing some lectures on actually what can leaders learn from Picasso. Um, kind of catchy phrase, but how creativity is key to innovation and is the same process of going through different iterations. With the recent developments with AI and chat GPT and what we can do now through mid-journey, I was just showing, trying to explain to my sons who have told me, by the way, that without the chat GPT, they probably wouldn't have passed the year. So they obviously have been very advanced in their use of chat GPT. But in a way, what we can already do for creativity uh, using AI, um, it really questions and puts us, redefines the way we think about it. So, so what, um, what uh, in the, in the coming, coming up lectures about creativity, 
I still think there is a huge value of a uh, human um, and human creativity, but we should not be afraid of understanding and augmenting and using uh, artificial intelligence wherever it can help us. And I don't know if any of you of the listeners have tried to use uh, even DALI or uh, any other AI um, already tools that are available. And when you start playing with it, and I would never forget it, that, uh, you know, before I would work with some designers and uh, and it take took a lot of money and many, you know, many hours. Uh, right now we have it at our fingertips. So actually this thinking, what does it mean for us, for humans? Where where does it stop? Now, the, what in my in some of the lectures I've been doing or talks, lecture sounds wrong, I think it's more of a talk, uh, an exchange because we are all learning all the time. Uh, many people, uh, especially when I was doing it to CEOs, uh, you know, I was on the board of the bank with seven men, very much all MBA trained, uh, kind of very much left brain. And none of them ever thought soft skill or creativity is any use to the bottom line of the, of the PNL of the company, which is not true. Uh, so I think I convinced some of them, but also, a lot of them, they said, uh, a lot of CEOs think, I have no creativity. I cannot draw. I have no interest even. So uh, there is actually a very famous book that I, um, that I often quote. And it's, uh, it's, the title is Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And it's actually a course. So Jess is nodding. So it's, it's, you can, in five days, I can take anyone who thinks they can only draw a stick man. Uh, after five days, you'll be able to draw a sophisticated portrait. So it just shows that what we believe sometimes creativity is, so ability to draw, is actually a skill. It's, it's also a way of looking at objects and things. So, so that's, so never give up. We are all creative. That is the, the truth. You just maybe didn't have the opportunity to tap into that. And I think now is the time to be tapping into this creativity uh, as soon as possible, because that is the key. I have so much to say, um, but Jess, I want to pass it to you for questions. You've been so polite letting me just ask Roxana questions so far. Um, you know, it, it, I really like a number of the philosophies you brought up there. Um, I'm probably going to take it a little more personal. Like I think about my life and... When people ask me what I do, I get anxiety because it's too many things and I'm going to overwhelm them. And they just want one answer. They, they want like this one thing to sum me up with. And I am totally going to plagiarize you on having a portfolio life. Like this is my new answer. I, I'm so excited. That's it. <laughs> I was like. But, but Jess, I totally understand you because also I've realized when people ask, you and you are in a conversation or you meet someone i've learned over time to just get very simple because we all have that we all want to be able to put someone in a certain box or a frame whatever it is so i what i came up with was i'm a financier and an artist right like which obviously i if i would start telling and i do this because actually at the end of the day these are all like to me like the uh, part of my art, but also through movies. This is all creativity. So it could be many other things, but I totally understand and portfolio and not even portfolio career to me, because I think I used to think portfolio career, but career to me has got a certain, for, at least personally, because um, I believe, you know, like when we talk about work-life balance, there's no work life balance let's face it there's everything is you know work is part of life and also this balance doesn't exist it's getting close to the balance but in fact i've decided that to me it's portfolio life so what your life consists of and you know and it changes as well but the the co common theme to me is finance as a i guess background what i've done you know as a profession and then all the other additional things so, and they can choose. Well, I love that so much. I've, I've been telling people on the business side, I've, I started telling people, um, oh, I, I run a holding company that owns some businesses. And they can somehow understand that. They say, well, I own this company and this company and this company. 
you know, but I haven't thought about it for like the whole life. So I'm, I'm definitely going to plagiarize you. Um, so I know there are so many things we have, there's so many things that we could talk about. Um, maybe one that is extra interesting to me is it sounds like we both had, uh, lifelong, uh, love for the movie business, which, uh, Laura has huge amounts of experience in. But when you think about things like financing this, uh, Oliver Stone documentary or, or the other movies you've been a part of, um, thinking about the mix here of, of your finance brain and, and your artistic interest, I'm interested in what that decision tree looks like for you when you're deciding where you're going to put hard in dollars. Uh, you know, actually, in, in my specific case with, uh, because I know Laura truly can say she spent time in movies, I would say I've done two. So, so it's not really a, a huge sample. However, the reason, in, in, in my case, it was very simple. The reason I got involved with both movies were purely, there was no tree. It was gut feeling. And the first one is called Battles of Britain. And it's actually, I'm Polish originally, so um, very patriotic. It, it was about highlighting the role of Polish pilots in Battle of Britain. So in fact, when the when I read the script and that I, I've never done a movie before, okay, so just full disclosure. And, and when they came to me with this project, first of all, I liked the people who were behind it. And I loved the mission because it was not a documentary, actually. That was a short, it was a short movie, comedy drama, that is meant to, in a quite, it, through a story, tell this important story about the role the Polish pilots play during Battle of Britain. Does the concept of, you know, a different nation fighting for, for a diff, for another one and, and, and the fact, uh, that, uh, Polish pilots were not fully recognized at the beginning, but it wasn't about preaching. The idea was actually, Let's tell the people the story. So I was, I fell in love with that. So probably that's not how you should be making financial decisions. But I also knew, look, the risk is low. It's a very small budget because that the first one was a short movie. Um, and in fact, it was an amazing adventure. And I realized how much work goes into producing a short movie. And, you know, it's, it all sounds so glamorous, but the reality is, of course, it, it's always different. But it was, I was very proud and I'm still very proud of this project with uh, Oliver Stone, uh, with the nuclear now. Again, it's a very specific project. It's, it's again that the movie, the documentary is really a life mission for, for nuclear and to see his passion, the story he wants to tell about, um, something that to be honest, I didn't have a very deep knowledge or I thought I'm an engineer. I kind of understand. Um, now, I had so many misconceptions about nuclear, nuclear power. And, uh, and in fact, when I learned about the project originally through a producer, Fernando, um, I knew that it's based on a book by Professor Joshua Goldstein called Bright Future. So the first thing I did, I read the book and truly like the way the book is written, very in a really approachable, very straightforward way. Uh, and I was like, wow, I had so many misconceptions. I want to be part of that story. So it really was purely a gut feeling. Again, it's a documentary. It's not, you know, multi-million uh, Hollywood production when you really are taking such huge risks. The risks were mitigated. I also knew that right now, uh, you know, because bottom line of, of the nuclear now is showing how nuclear is the only available scale green energy right now that the technology we have and have had and uh, and is the solution to climate change and why we need to be of course not just nuclear but we should be pursuing all the other options we have but we have not much time and and once you i would love you to watch the documentary it's uh, it's been released in the us it's going to be released in um in europe uh, i also took it and took oliver to davos at the world economic forum and just to see the impact that the documentary had on, on people, you know, the beauty of it also, it's a marriage, I call it, between professor who just thinks, again, this kind of left and right brain comes into play on the professor who thinks figures and, and very tree-like organized. And, you know, here we've got Oliver Stone, who is, uh, you know, who is an amazing, legendary producer, sometimes controversial with this passion for telling the story and imagine both of them working together 
they had no idea what they are getting themselves into. They said both of them, it was the hardest project ever. It took much longer. They were, it, it was a nightmare on many levels. But I think what was created is something really magic, magical. And, um, and it's not my words. It's really the words because after you've been for such a long time in it, uh, then you start really seeing it. You, you just, we were watching the reactions of others. And I think the beauty, it speaks to a high school student can watch it and truly understand and, and a professor who is very deep in the subject. And we, we, we are quoting a nuclear influencer. There is just, look, it's not something that people will be rushing to the cinema for entertainment, but it's definitely very important uh, piece of work. And, uh, and just seeing the feedback we are receiving is just extraordinary. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, gut feeling and impact and mission really were driving my uh, movie decision. Well, I want to let Laura talk, but I want to ask one more question first. So, um, you know, I started my first energy investing in maybe like 05, 06. And over that time, it's kind of become a passion to me. You know, you look at our charity, Child Rescue, and how tight it is. Like human, you know, child trafficking specifically is very tied to poverty and you look at what an incredible opportunity gaining access to energy is for lifting nations out of poverty. And um, I, I really had no idea of just how safe small nuclear and some of the things have become. And it's only been the last few years that you're watching some of Bill Gates' investments and some of these folks that are like, it, it's almost sad that it's called nuclear because it gets us so associated with the previous things. It's almost like it like needs a whole new name for this. It, it, it's, it's almost like a whole new category is what it feels like to me. I don't know if you feel similar. Absolutely. And we've had this comment uh, quite a few times. And indeed, I agree. And we were thinking about it to rename it. Now, you know, there, there are two options. Either you rename it and uh, which indeed uh, there is this fear associated that, as I say, I had myself. Now, on the other hand, uh, you can look at it differently, uh, the way even the documentary already gained traction. We had Bono and Schwarzenegger, you know, so some people say, well, it's going mainstream now if you have, you know, influencer and celebrities commenting on it. Um, and we really want to ultimately make it available for free to humanity, to, to schools, to universities. But uh, I do agree with you. And maybe that's something we should still try to um, address. Uh, because there is this deeply engraved reaction we all get when you mention nuclear. People associate with nuclear weapons, and and it, it's just a psychological reaction. So, so very good point. Uh, we did look at this, uh, and maybe we should still uh, revisit. <laughs> so, thank you, um, <laughs> Laura. What, what kind of what name would you give it? What name would you give it? I don't know because. I mean, there's the idea of, you look at the idea of how much effort it is. So looking like Jack Trout, who made the term positioning popular back, you know, 30 years ago. And, um, I, you know, some of my favorite books in the space, you know, the Harvard professor, Young Me Moon, her book, Different, uh, Jack Trout's other book, Differentiate or Die, Blue Ocean Strategy. One of my favorites in last year is, is Play Bigger about this idea of, um, not just inventing a product, but inventing the category for it. And so this idea of like, could you, I mean, the idea of like branding at new nuclear, branding at safe nuclear, something like this could have a shot, but like, is there some other aspect? Is there some other aspect? Like you look at fusion, you look at something that's a completely different word. You know, is there a completely different word that isn't, that doesn't make you feel like you're hiding from the fact that it's nuclear, but it's emphasizing a different element of it. And it's like, I just think about all the different art movements and like it was still just painting, but it was so, it was so different. It deserved its own category. And if you read the book by Joshua, uh, Bright Future, in fact, uh, one of the chapters, first chapters, we describe nuclear without naming nuclear and using a Swedish word for it. And then at the end of the chapter, we say, you know, Joshua says, I say we now, now uh, Joshua says, uh, and it was actually that two, two authors, but just Joshua was very active with us traveling. Uh, and they say it's actually nuclear. So, and you know, when you read it without knowing, you say, oh my God, why? Like, this is the, this is the solution. This is the answer. 
and then and then indeed it's named nuclear. So yeah, it's a very interesting. Uh, you know, how, if you rebrand it or if you call it fission, or you know, there is this whole education that would need to that would need to happen. Well, I have some comments. First of all, um, I I've been living this particular reality with nuclear for the last couple of years. I, I raised money for a fusion energy company last year. I'm still working with them now. And um, I actually had to put a deck together that explained the difference between fission and fusion because the overarching assumption was like, well, fusion's going to blow up. That's actually not true. It's actually the safe version of it. And so I having a, having a, an overarching narrative to the category, I think, would really help. But I think that tools like films and things that will educate and inspire are really important. Like, um, I, I raised money for a senator in like the mid 2000 teens and um, I would like host these events for for them to to raise money. And uh, one of the questions and there were filmmakers in the room, investors in the room, creatives, uh, you know, all sorts of people. And um, if someone asked the, the senator, what more can we do to further your cause? And the senator said, the best thing you can do is to keep making content because when I go to the Hill and I'm trying to get a bill to the floor and I hand a fellow senator a 3,000 page document or a DVD of a documentary, which one do you think they're going to pay attention to first? And it, and, it, and it's the movie because it's just it's easier. These are human beings making decisions. They're not superhuman. Um, and so having content that really contextualizes these complex issues are very valuable and that value may not be reflected in the box office, but it ends up being reflected at places like the World Economic Forum or, you know, the floor of the Senate and things like that. And and that's I wish that could be quantified. Um, but um, anyway, so those are kind of my my thoughts in that area. Um, and, I uh, and yes, and if I can add and you're right. Absolutely. We want the story. We want the movie. Now, for my son's generation, I have two sons. 11 and 15 and all the, the the way they consume as we know the 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 content is tiktok so so in fact we do have i mentioned to you isabel who is the influencer and she has done she had her you know she has her tiktok channel which was which is amazing and and i think it should address all the all these different uh media for sure mm -hmm. That's i i told i i could not agree more and i have been trying to talk to my peers in film and television about how younger generations they they want co faster content they need the dopamine hits sooner and they are segueing into shorter form content um and longer form content it, it it seems to take too long for them and i think we have to really think about that as gen z and the younger generations age into the 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 voting brackets um into the viewer brackets and and all of that but um Anyway, I, um, you were saying something about um, speaking to very left brain people in business about creativity, and it reminded me of a story. I don't know if you have any examples of this, but it reminded me of a, a woman that I, I know. She works for a very big tech company that we all know, and um, she was tasked. She, she's like a, a chief culture officer and strategist at this very large company. And um, she, something that she figured out was that there were programmers and engineers who were working on projects far longer than they should have. And so she did something in the culture where she has like a, I don't know if you know what this is, but it's called Dia de los Muertos, which is like a Mexican holiday to commemor like com commemorate the dead, give honor to them. So within the company they have a Dia de los Muertos for the engineers and the teams to basically take any projects that need to be put to bed, <laughs> just killed basically, and honor all of the team members, how hard everyone worked. And they have this ceremony. Like I saw photos of people's with their faces painted as, as though it was, it was a very interesting, creative idea to actually affect PNL because then those people felt acknowledged and they could then move on to a new project instead of trying to justify an old one and there's a direct correlation between creativity 
and PNL in that particular instance. And I'm wondering if if you have any other thoughts around creativity in the boardroom or um, at the C-suite level. So, so what you just described about the the kind of ritual uh, it's been used in ancient cultures, and it's and it's really actually in psychology as well. Uh, it's often uh, utilized, uh, and indeed, it's a psychological process where you create certain ritual that is, um, and you know, you can, you know, it's quite popular actually in some of the psychology uh, therapies when you, let's say, do a closure to something what you described and you let's say write something and you take time and then you burn it so so actually we need as human beings to process it and uh, and it's actually very helpful and i think what what i would say is that we got a little bit i guess what i've observed as well carried away by is that you know in business we are meant to be very serious it's a very serious matter there's no space for play or for fun because we are here, you know, working like, you know, for this listed massive company and we are here doing very important things. So when you introduce, but we, we also know from psychology from, that, that in fact, the way um, we can probably end up adding to the bottom line is through this creativity, creating something that is not, a linear thinking way. So, uh, so I was sitting in board meetings and uh, everyone is very much focused what in Excel spreadsheet, you know, where your numbers were going up and down. And if you can justify the numbers are going up and why by this percentage you are safe. And, you know, we can create a very elaborate explanation why. Now, if you were to really look behind, sometimes in a more creative way, and I'll give you a very simple example. You know, we're looking at the numbers of, let's say, private banking and we see, oh my God, the numbers shifted. And, and actually, when you look, it could be one client, even one massive client. And as we know, in private banking, actually, it takes at least 18 months, let's say, on average to build relationship. And it's, it's, uh, it's, you cannot measure and you cannot manage uh, in a, especially that business human relation by looking at the straight line numbers and trying to justify. So, um, so actually introducing the curiosity, the play, the, the ability to look at the problem. You know, I, I will never forget my first board meeting and, uh, I ended up with like three assistants. Like, why do I need three assistants? And, you know, and then, and then I said, can you print out, you know, first time, first board meeting print out uh, the documents I need to read for tomorrow. And she looks at me a little bit like hesitant. And she said, we, well, we use iPads now, like, and we are saving the trees. I said, yes, I know. But the first time I really just want to be like, have it all printed because sometimes iPads don't work. I don't know. I just wanted to be extra prepared. And she says, okay. The next thing I, I see is like, she brings me this pile of documents. And I'm like, I asked for just tomorrow. I said, no, 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 that's for tomorrow. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so it was shock. Uh, so, so that's, uh, one of the first hard lessons. I was like, okay, so how on earth I'm going to read all these documents, have an opinion and actually try to comprehend all these. Documents. Of course, it was a inhumane task. But anyway, unfortunately, uh, that was part, uh, part of, uh, of the job description I haven't been given at that time. But luckily it wasn't every meeting like that. But, um, but actually, if you, if you go to this mode of left brain, when we are like, okay, this is the serious stuff, this is what we are doing. But I remember because already when I, that was my last job in finance and I was already a bit older. It's all relative, but, and it, it wasn't, I did, wasn't taking this job as like, this is the most that's the, the important thing in the world. I actually was thinking, you know what? I actually didn't want this job to be honest. So, so it was a bit of a different attitude. Now, um, so I allowed myself a little bit of space to be myself. And in fact, what was interesting, I was a bit scared at the beginning. I said, oh my God, they're going to think I'm completely either crazy or like, you know, but of course they knew, okay, I mean, she's been 20 years in finance. She worked for the big banks. You know, she is serious. She's got CFA, engineer. She's got all these titles. She can't be stupid. Right? So at least on paper. 
And, um, and in fact, what I realized uh, after introducing the more play, creativity, and this artistic part of me, and the way of looking at uh, solving problems, in fact, I started, and I didn't realize it myself, to be honest. Um, it was more my intuition. I realized that people get out into their more of a creative zone, and actually you can see issues and find solutions much quicker from a different side that that you just simply don't see when you're stuck in your kind of left brain linear thinking. And we know it at Stanford, the D school, you know, they start off, I don't know if you've ever experienced, you know, the, the process of, you know, I was taken through, through this course and, you know, we start jumping, becoming silly, uh, just moving your body and, and tapping into that flow. So I think at every boardroom, uh, we all uh, could benefit from having a bit more fun and playfulness and bringing is this kind of artistic mindset. And it will add to the bottom line. Oh, I, I so. couldn't agree more. I have, I have one more comment to underscore what you're saying, and then I'll pass it back to Jess. Um, I, I have a friend who coaches um, founders who have had big exits. They're looking for their next thing or you know, corporate leaders who are managing very large P&L. And um, he he charges so much, I, I don't think I could ever hire him. But I, I asked him, I said, give me one piece of advice that you give your clients. And he said, play. And I said, what? And he said, if you introduce an element of fun and play into your everyday work with people, it's like a release valve for people in a very high pressure situation. It makes you unique. It takes the pressure off. And people, they can actually free themselves up to be to think creatively when you introduce this element of play so often leaders are very intimidating to the people who report to them and so if, if you can introduce that element of some creativity or play um you you actually end up getting a lot more done and you close deals quicker and things like that so it totally resonates with what you're saying so thank you for just giving detail and color to all of that well i Okay, I want to go in the other direction. We talked about movies. Let's talk about finance. Um, so, large bank in Poland. I think I saw maybe like fifty-four billion under management. Does that sound about right, or am I off? Um, when you think of when you think about what you did differently in your career, there's a lot of people that would like to be, you know, uh, deputy CEO of a fifty-four billion dollar institution. Okay, um, and and yet almost nobody makes it to that level. When you think about what's different about you or what you did different, um, what do you think that is? Look, I actually, uh, there's no one right answer. Everyone has a different journey. Now, what I definitely would say, and again, it wasn't the case actually in my particular one, but obviously there are two ways. Either you, you really are focused and you have a very clear vision. Some people do. I did not. Okay, so I'll just start with this. In fact, I've been meaning to leave finance I've spent this as uh, Laura said two decades, but I've been meaning to leave finance for like 10 years. Okay. So I was like, okay, the next one I'm going to leave, I'm going to create more time for me. But obviously I wasn't ready. Now, um, to me, when people ask me like, why you don't do, you know, art that you really love and, you know, you're creating these pieces of work. Why don't you just full time do this? And, and again, going back just to the portfolio life. I think I was like afraid I would get bored, you know, like, and also how about I lose my inspiration, and, you know, I just wake up and, and it's also different when you have to think of your art as, I don't know, paying for your children's school. Like, I think it's really changes and you, at least to me, and you have to compromise. I never, like art for me is my total freedom and I don't want to ever compromise anything there. So, but again, that's me. That's how I was looking at art. Now in finance, uh, What's interesting, I guess, because I have spent, I've seen so many different sides of finance. I mean, I started off in project finance, then I was on the trading floor of JP Morgan who was doing derivative sales. Then I moved to Merrill Lynch doing fixed income sales. Then I was uh, running ultra high net worth thing for Credit Suisse. So in fact, every, if you look, um, and luckily no one was looking in too much detail, but like I have changed within even finance. I've done like 10 different jobs, right? So, so in fact, I could never get bored. Um, and I guess that lends itself, um, a bit into being in, in one of the top leadership because, 
you know, I was not, people often say, I don't know, in bond sales, right, for 20 years. And they know it inside out. They know they can do it with their eyes closed. Uh, to me, it just was not what was driving me. I really love the the challenge of being surrounded, but actually finance used to uh, attract really amazing people. Like it used to be at least 20, 15 years ago, like what is the, the almost like a, one of the ultimate jobs to have, like what's the most challenged job is to end up, you know, the Wall Street in the city of London. So, and because of that, it's really attracted amazing individuals. Uh, and I would say, even though uh, also, you know, I'm not saying, I mean, being a banker used to be a cool thing to do, you know, it's changed um, and it's lost its shine for sure, uh, at least to me. But I would say having seen uh, really, because when people say you work in finance, right, like actually there are so many different roles within finance. Uh, so it, it, it's uh, to me, I think having been kind of always pushing and being like willing to, to get out of the comfort zone because even when I was my first bank, when I was at EBRD, uh, I started off at uh, strategic planning and then treasury, uh, uh, strategic planning, then I moved to project finance. And then I will never forget that the ultimate dream within EBRD was to end up on the on the treasury, on the kind of small trading floor that they had. And, and, and apparently almost no one from, you can go from treasury anywhere, but not the other way around. And I was just curious and I came up like to the, actually it was a woman running it. And I said, look, I, I would do like anything. I'm ha ready to work hard and like, I would love to get this job. I even didn't understand exactly what this job entails, but I understood is like the most challenging thing to do. So again, I'm not saying it's, it's the right way, but to me, I had no limitation and I was not afraid to fail and to try. And I said, look, what's the worst? I mean, if I don't succeed, you know, then, you know, at least I've tried. So I definitely, I've seen a lot in the past because I was not afraid of this failure ever. Uh, that allowed me to actually push the boundaries and people who are probably much better than me, but they were just so afraid, like not to, they said, no, maybe, you know, in a few years time, this is not the right time. So almost being that fearless uh, allowed me for certain to, to kind of uh, feed my curiosity, but also to be able to see all these different sides of an institution. So that's definitely one, I would say, a thing that allowed me to, to get, let's say, but again, success is so that we can do the whole podcast on success. What's success, right? But, um, to me, it's, it's, it's really changed its meaning over time. I feel like that last answer could be its own book. Like, I feel like we see the, like, like that <laughs> itself is like, like exactly. that's the opening, that's the opening to the book. That's I mean, it. we need the whole book. <laughs> it, 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 all the that. I love it. Um, lucky, lucky, luckily we can now use AI to help <laughs> yeah, write right. the book because I've been waiting for that. So, um, well, listen, this has been so lovely. Um, if people want to find out more about your work, they want to find out more about your photography and they want to find out about the documentaries, um, all the different programs and projects and things you do. Where are some of the best places they can follow you or, or learn more? Yeah, I have to work on that. So there's definitely, I'm, I'm easily available on LinkedIn under my name, Roxana Turisek. And I know it's impossible to spell. So, um, but also I've got my uh, Instagram account where I, again, when I was on the board of the bank, when I was in finance, I was not really allowed to talk much uh, about my more fun parts. Uh, so I'm not a very active user, but I've got, again, I've got my Instagram, uh, as well, which is under my, my full name and, uh, and just maybe, uh, chat GPT, Google, <laughs> but I would say LinkedIn, LinkedIn probably has the, has the, the biggest amount of, uh, I would say I actually did, uh, take, take time to try to reflect kind of things I've done. So. I would I would also encourage people to um, Google Roxana's sculptures. What is the name of the sculpture that has traveled all around the world? Aurea. So it's uh, Aurea Kintsugi is actually on Instagram. And uh, it's uh, right now actually at Sadly Castle. Uh, but it's being launched at COP26. Uh, it's the recycled stainless steel sculpture. There is another one which is similar, different color, which is right now in Poland. Uh, but it's green uh, and then there are smaller versions as well 
based on this uh, bigger sculpture, actually Stanford uh, commissioned me to create a trophy for Selena Gomez for advocacy for mental health. So it's almost like a replica of, of the big, uh, big sculpture because this whole Kintsugi concept just like it applies to, it can really apply to us. It applies to mental health. It applies to our broken planet. It's just like one simple concept that really covers all these. So, um, you know, it's owned by Singularity University, the, the first sculpture. So there is this whole actually Instagram where I post. Um, the kind of journey of the of the uh, sculpture, and it will be coming to Dubai, where I live now, for COP twenty eight. So amazing! I, I wanted people to Google it because they 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 now spend an hour hearing about your banking resume, and now I want them to juxtapose that to the sculptures that you've made. Like creativity is really accessible to everyone, and. Jess, when he asked me to co-host um, a few podcasts with him, he said, "I, you know, I want to talk to people who should be famous." And I was like, "Well, I feel like Roxana. <laughs> she should I be." I still famous. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, well, in, so in our in our circles, you certainly are, and now more people <laughs> will know about you. So, thank you for coming on and talking to us. Thank you, such a pleasure, guys. Thank you, I really appreciate it. It was really fun. So fun. Thank you, Jess. Okay, thanks everyone for listening.